Hello again and welcome to today's Ask the Expert on Supporting Food Security Policies in Fragile States. This is a special event affiliated with AgriLink's Food Security Policy Month this June. Uh, my name is April Thompson. I'm the Knowledge Management Portfolio Manager at the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project, which oversees AgriLinks among other knowledge sharing platforms. I'm excited to be facilitating today's discussion featuring Jeff Hill, who is the Director of the Office of Economic Growth and Agriculture in USAID South Sudan. Before I introduce our, our featured, featured guest further, I want to just quickly go over how the event will work today. We've got a number of great questions already from those of you who registered and um, had some um, questions for Jeff, which I'll be reading aloud with some questions of my own, as well as um, any late burning questions that you have for Jeff, um, which you can just simply enter through the chat box, and we will be um, looking at that throughout the event. So uh, without further ado, um, to turn to today's topic, we know that agriculture and food security is, is critical in driving agricultural transformation. But today's question is, what can we do in countries often deemed fragile facing complex emergency conditions where institutions are often altogether missing? We're going to hear some emerging lessons today on that from Jeff Hill, who again um, is dialing in today from South Sudan. Jeff is a USAID veteran of more than 25 years, previously having served as the Director for Policy in the Bureau for Food Security where he led U.S. government interagency efforts to advance globally agriculture and food security policies of the Feed the Future initiative. Over the past 15 years, Jeff has played a central role in coordinating the U.S. government support for the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program of the African Union, better known as CADIF. He has a B.S. in Public Administration from Weber State University and an M.S. in Agricultural Economics and Agronomy from the University of California. So Jeff, welcome. Are you Thank with you, us, Jeff? Great. Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Um, so I, to, to kick it off, um, maybe you can just uh, set the stage for us and, and tell us a little about the, the South Sudan context. Um, and what you see as the priorities and opportunities for a policy change there? Well, let, so South Sudan, a little bit of, uh, you know, you drill into the hard reality here is that it's uh, clearly one of the poorest places in the world, has uh, some of the highest percentage of uh, the population that are needing emergency assistance of any place in the world. That there is a uh, it has some of the highest uh, proportion of people that are in absolute uh, poverty and hunger uh, in the world you know and on the policy front you know it's it you know there is uh, also it's not a pretty picture right it is it indeed if you want to talk about you know the uh, national government being important in policy the policy apparatus you know here doesn't work um, for at you know at the national level, uh, so uh, the you know being able to actually, if you're going to define policy as being able and needing to work with the national government, it is it is not something that is um, possible to do here because fundamentally at the national level, you know the uh, the apparatus doesn't work and the national authorities do not have the ability to make decisions and the will or ability to implement them. So. You have to think about things differently here in uh, South Sudan about how to actually advance uh, some of the policy and enabling environment that is uh, so important for being able to tackle the you know the food security you know challenges that uh, that they have here. So it's uh, the country is is indeed in in, in conflict. We're hoping for you know peace, uh, but uh, we are dealing with a reality that this is a uh, country in a protracted uh, uh, conflict and, and a complex uh, situation. Uh, so, uh, so there are, having said that, you know, there is, an, an, is a unique um, and rare you know, circumstance where you actually have you know, a, a confluence of interest from you know, the donors, uh, from the UN agencies, from NGOs, you know, that uh, are able to work together. And, 
work with those people that do have the ability to work and make decisions and implement those. Those are the people you know, at the community level. And so you need to readjust some of the way that you think you know, about uh, creating an enabling environment to allow you know, uh, development and, uh, to, take, uh, to take place. Um, and uh, so there's a, you know, the priorities here, right, are really looking at, you know, what are the steps that you need to be, you know, putting in place to, you know, create, you know, the resilience uh, and, and enable people to actually have the coping capacity to, you know, absorb the kind of shocks, you know, that they face, right, uh, both political, economic, and uh, food-related shocks. Um, meaning that you need to be able to actually look at a different constellation of actors at uh, local levels. Uh, policy here is really, you know, coming to terms with, you know, building communities of champions that are really decentralized, more local uh, levels, you know, that are prepared to actually commit to the kind of reform and change needed to allow you know, services to be delivered and to allow, you know, stability to be created, right, and uh, to allow goods to be able to move between markets and, you know, farms and to allow people, you know, to, you know, produce, you know, food. That sounds like a, a daunting environment to, to work in indeed, and I, I, I'd like to actually um, um, field you a, a question from one of the registrants, which I think is a, a very relevant one, um, which is your view on, on the best timing or sequence to work on um, said policies or other sectoral challenges in a fragile state like South Sudan, given that um, the temptation can be to wait till the environment settles, but that there is evidence that such work can help mitigate conflict as well. Yeah, so I, I, I want to try to be very clear that, in fact, you know, there are, you know, significant opportunities for being able to influence, you know, the enabling environment, you know, at a local level. This is getting down to, you know, the different uh, state levels and, you know, a decentralized way of being able to think about this. Because there you can actually, actually work with coalition of leaders, champions, people that have that are important people in creating stability and being able, you know, to endorse, uh, you know, the the improvements needed locally there. But in terms of sequencing, you know, the you know clearly, you know, in an environment like this, the amount of change it is change the context is changing oftentimes, you know, very quickly. Let me give you some examples. You know, five years ago there was a there was, in fact, a, you know, a population that was roughly, you know, 12 million people, and it was spread across, you know, the country in, in, in different ways. Today, you know, the probably half of the people in the country don't live in the same place they lived in five years ago. The changes in population that are there, the changes in livelihood systems, you know, are actually pretty dramatic in terms of the shifts, and so. So in, in terms of having data and information, you know, that is, that is helping to inform, you know, real choices and, and, and real opportunities is, you know, is, is a real challenge. And so investing in actually understanding these dynamics and changes is critically important. And so sequencing, it's, you know, the issue is really being able to have real-time information or more current information to be able to do real, you know, uh, evidence-based uh, analysis to inform some of the options on this. Uh, so sequencing, you know, and and being able to actually, you know, look at, you know, uh, in this particular kind of environment, you know, being able to model and understand pathways out of, you know, uh, the kind of uh, actions is is critically important, to, so that so there can be evidence-based and informed conversations really taking place. Uh, so much of the discussion is about how to respond, you know, to emergency, which it is important to do, right, that there is not, you know, the, the uh, thinking to give, to, to help people think about um, a different kind of trajectory. And, and, and that's what we're doing, is putting evidence on the table and looking at different scenarios that it doesn't need to be the same. So this is a, a bit of part of the sequencing issue. 
Oh, great, thank you. So, um, I guess you've already sort of hinted uh, to a, a, a few elements of this in terms of how we work differently um, in an environment like this compared to stable environments in, in, in terms of, you know, really real-time monitoring um, as populations and um, systems are in flux. Um, but can you tell us a little about some, some other ways that you think um, just kind of looking at South Sudan, but um, you know, other similar contexts and, and kind of things to take in, into account um, in, in the way that you approach um, rebuilding um, and um, putting good policies in place. Yeah, here, you know, I mean, one of the a real true priority here is really how are you going to be able to actually advance resilience? How do you actually build the coping capacity and protect the coping capacities of people, right, so that uh, you know, so that they are not needing emergency assistance to meet their basic needs. This is a this is a true challenge. The erosion of coping capacity is directly and explicitly linked, you know, to increases in the need for humanitarian assistance. And so, how do you, you know, how you do that is in 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 approaching this is really recognizing that you can maybe get down to you know real local levels, working at a community level. You know where you can, you know, uh, begin to build relationships with, you know, the uh, the communities and the commitment to, uh, to to change. So decentralization is is remarkably important. The other issue here is, is that it isn't an it isn't an option for a donor for USAID, you know, to in fact go it alone in a given any given location, no matter how you know, small or, or, or uh, big the location is, you know, the, you know, the need for being able to actually, you know, see strategic integration take place across different donors is remarkably important. And so the need for co-location, you know, and, and building systems for collaboration that are not normally used, you know, putting in place and having better discipline on coordination, you know, securing different uh, establishing different tools for securing, you know, commitment and accountability, you know, are uh, remarkably different and important to, you know, to uh, put in place here. And it really is across different kind of sectoral, you know, concerns. You're tackling the issues of resilience, food security, and really laying the foundations for, you know, how local communities can transform and recover requires that there be multi-sectoral kinds of efforts. And so, you know, being able to see real integration, you know, of the, 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 the peace and uh, social cohesion efforts along with essential services, you know, brought together and being, being able to tackle the productive uh, assets of, uh, of people. These things, so the need for greater integ for integration is much greater here than it is in, in many or most, uh, you know, countries in the world. And this is beyond actually a fragile country. This country is a troubled, in a troubled state uh, that is having more, you know, complicated situations than many. But even said that, if you don't pay attention to those strategic issues, you know, you're just going to let the country fall into greater, greater vulnerability. In this country, 30 percent of the the food that is is eaten in the country comes from emergency assistance. Thirty-five percent is actually coming through markets. That means, you know, the, the, and the rest of it is coming from self-production. Not attending to the incentives and the issues that are actually allowing markets to work and production to take place means that you're actually contributing to the, you know, to the erosion uh, of uh, the coping capacity. And so, uh, you know, while you know humanitarian assistance in a country like this is remarkably important. It is nowhere near sufficient to actually tackle, you know, the kinds of uh, challenges being faced. That actually leads into um, a couple of questions that we had uh, around um, food assistance and, and markets. Um, and uh, one uh, participant wanted to know what your assessment of efforts to, to use food assistance to, to build or strengthen food systems and value chains in places like South Sudan, um, WFP, for example. Um, what's your take on that? 
Well, what we're seeing here is that, you know, the uh, using food assistance for, you know, especially things like uh, uh, food for asset building is uh, uh, tremendously useful in a way, you know, for, you know, whether it is building schools, building, you know, uh, clinics, taking, you know, helping to create feeder roads, you know, working, you know, on creating the market structures, you know, so that, you know, uh, you know, and as well as just you know, fundamental, uh, uh, you know, shared resource management is is remarkably helpful in, you know, in um, you know, in actually, you know, helping to 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 put in place things that are helping to protect coping capacity, right, and uh, meeting uh, meeting some basic needs at the same time, right. So so food aid, you know, can be and has been, you know, uh, really helpful. You know, in 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 this country, even though it it is you know significantly constrained with markets, the number of you know cash-based uh, uh, food assistance programs um, that are you know, are being uh, operated are, are, are remarkable, right? Uh, and that you know, in helping to you know bring into you know the system some of the you know the uh, both incentives and the you know the resources to um, you know keep things working. Uh, so food aid, you know, in this environment can be, you know, extremely helpful, right, in uh, tackling some of the core issues around, you know, resilience. Has it all been done that way? No, right? And that is one of the, so this really, there is a real interest in being able to bridge between humanitarian assistance and, you know, uh, the development assistance for uh, building resilience. That's a follow-up question from um, one of our um, regular participants here, Dick Kinsley, who, who asked, given the limited financial resources of the government, how much of the agricultural production markets and support services operate independent of, of governments um, in South Sudan? 100%. So literally all so there, you know, there is a remarkable, you know, ability to so be able to actually reach different parts of the country. And we, you know, through you know the different uh, service arrangements that are in place here that are being supported, you know, through UN systems and NGOs and you know other partners, we're reaching roughly 90, 95 percent of the different parts of the country. Not consistently, but in fact, you know, being able to reach. This much of the country with the with the different kinds of core basic services, you know, to provide help is a rather amazing uh, number. It uh, you know in in an organized you know way being able to see messages you know uh, being uh, delivered you know uh, to different areas there, as well as different you know in emergency inputs and and uh, assistance on that. So the service delivery system here is deep and is effective, and if it didn't exist, there would be, you know, true, uh, true famine here. And, and, you know, but, but it does offer opportunities for being able to actually deliver, you know, effective, you know, uh, agricultural knowledge and different kinds of, you know, uh, you know, services uh, in ways that are, are, are surprising, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, and so the reach you know, is 100% covered by non-government uh, agencies. I mean, for those that may not know, actually, you know, we are restricted from providing any assistance whatsoever to any government agency uh, in the country, and you know, as are uh, other donors. And so, the actual implementation and services are all working outside, you know, of the government uh, infrastructure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, a, mi a moment ago, you talked about kind of the need for um, um, evidence-driven um, decision-making. And uh, one of the registrants wanted to know your experience in ensuring that policymakers take into consideration research evidence as opposed to you know, what's politically correct. Yeah, so uh, in the country, again, another surprising feature is that, you know, because there is um, both a concern about information evidence there, and and in some ways it has been, you know, really building upon the back of, you know, the uh, the the need of the emergency community to actually 
figure out where there is a problem and deliver assistance. Real information system, data systems do exist here you know, for and, and, and reaching uh, the countries. The, the IPC system, which is founded on the food um, and food security and nutrition monitoring system, you know, supplemented with uh, panel data systems for the country, generate you know some of the best information and data you know at the household level that you know I've seen in Africa, and that's a lot of Africa. And <clears throat> so, to a surprising amount, there is real you know uh, good um, uh, information and data for being able. To, so there is at and and there is an infrastructure at a local level, meaning at the state level, for being able to actually you know, collect, review, and make available, you know, this information. Two rounds of national level surveys are completed every year, um, along with uh, at least one. Uh, and in many cases, uh, two rounds of uh, panel uh, data in uh, different uh, sentinel sites is completed uh, every year. Needed because of the fluid situation, right? But what that does mean is that there is a great deal of interest and attention to, you know, data and what is it, uh, what is it telling you, and so that you are using this at a local level, right? And really getting uh, a commitment of leaders in terms of what are they committed to on enabling environment means that they need to have in place, you know, the uh, information for uh, evidence. So we're putting in place accountability, raising uh, the accountability systems as being a tremendously important feature you know, of decision making here. So clarity of commitments and, and clarity in terms of being able to track you know, whether those commitments are being made you know, means that decision makers are you know, not paying attention. These are not government decision makers. These are people at a local level. These are people in non-government agencies. These are people at community, faith-based leaders that are making decisions you know, about, um, you know, what it is that uh, could and should be done. And how is that information kind of getting into the hands of, of um, folks that are working at the local level? Yeah, so, you know, there is in, you know, a, uh, a, a, a national information system that, you know, does, uh, does exist. So, you know, establishing, you know, effective, uh, you know, you know the, uh, the the internet. You know, has got good access here. You know, with service providers in general, uh, and compared, and so uh, certainly in all of the capital, in the state capitals, uh, there is uh, effective information uh, flows. You know, into the areas uh, when when we can ensure that there is uh, electricity, which is mostly done through uh, uh, through. Uh, renewable energy sources. Okay, we had an, another good question come in uh, from Courtney Buck, who asks, how can we strengthen community and subnational level capacities to manage coordination? And what are the most durable investments donors can make in these skills and capacities? Yeah, what would, you know, what is actually, you know, in this environment where there is no there is no, you know, established, you know, representative, you know, of any given place. So there, you know, governments don't necessarily represent the constituencies. The question is, how do you create groups and constituencies, you know, of people that, uh, you know, do have influence, that are, you know, informed, that, that uh, do have authority, including faith-based groups, uh, traditional leaders, you know, civil society, community leaders, uh, the private sector leaders, and being able, you know, to get, you know, these, you know, groups of champions, you know, working against a, a shared agenda and building their capacities to, you know, um, be able to, uh, to both advocate and, you know, uh, monitor, you know, whether things are actually being done. Helping with early warning systems so that they, and they understand, you know, both what are some of the shocks of, you know, whether it is a conflict, economic shocks, environmental shocks that to, to help uh, different leaders, you know, make some of the adjustments or population movements so that they can help, you know, uh, you know, make adjustments as needed uh, locally. So uh, there's a there's an 
getting 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 these and inclusive groups of people working together is uh, you know how do you do that is a lot of you know both trauma uh, and you know social cohesion uh, efforts that are critically important in this kind of environment but it's demonstrating real progress we're seeing real improvements where you know from the local level you know you are uh, able to see the uh, you know the creation of an enabling environment you know to a land allowed land to be you know made available uh, in a transparent way where you're able to you know uh, ensure that there aren't you know uh, the barriers in moving produce from farms to markets you know where you're having you know the stability of people to be able to move you know and, and where services can be delivered these create a number of enabling uh, issues that uh, are in other ways uh, really policy. So we had a, a related follow-up question come in from uh, Michael Che Kim, um, who, who wanted to, to know in the long term if, if, if you thought that fragile states welcomed multilateral organizations, um, UN, WTO, et, et cetera, coming in to help with things like capacity building or, and training. I didn't quite understand the question. Um, yeah, um, if fragile states um, such as South Sudan welcome multilaterals coming in to, to do this kind of um, trading and capacity building work in the long term? So I think in this environment, and you know, uh, it is very clear that in fact, you know, the uh, the world, the UN, has a, a moral imperative to, in fact, you know, uh, be present uh, in a country where, you know, the government isn't going to be in a position to be able to deliver services. And really through, you know, being part of, you know, the global community, the country, you know, and in this country, they, you know, there, there's, yes, they, they do accept, while there are various issues and tensions, with it, that this is critically important for you know the country. Um, you know, so the the presence of you know the UN agencies here, where you know, and and it had and it requires special pressures, you know, on uh, the public international organizations of being able to work differently here than they do, you know, uh, frankly in a more stable environment in different uh, different areas there. So. Uh, being able to work across some of their, you know, traditional boundary lines, there's real pressures of being able to do they do they welcome that? Yes, right. And do does the government recognize the importance of the number of these different international processes? Yes. Do they have the ability to actually, you know, engage in, support, and you know, uh, you know, deliver on any of the actions that may be discussed in in some of those processes? Not by themselves. I just want to flag we're, we're quickly coming to the end of our, our half hour here, but um, I, I guess I'd like to just ask one um, final question, which is what you've learned so far with your experience in South Sudan that you think may be instructive for policy works in, in similar contexts. What are some of the lessons learned? Well, I think that, you know, some of the lessons learned is that, you know, how to approach policy is sort of the more the core building blocks of you know policy are relevant in this environment as equally as they are in any other place you know but there are a you know of of making sure that you do have you know uh, effective evidence that you do have inclusive you know engagement you know in uh, the process that you do pay special attention to understanding winners and losers and that that requires even more attention in this kind of environment you know than it does you know in uh, in other more stable areas you know and you know what is also you know clear is that you can't come into a country like this with a cookie book you know cooking cutter or, or you know approach to say we know that worked you know, someplace else you have to be, you know, um, able to, you know, really, you know, be adaptive in, uh, in, in looking at, you know, what can work here. Uh, many of the ways that we do work in other countries are not 
going to work here. Well, thank you for those parting thoughts and for sharing your experiences today. This has been a great conversation, and I appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, I, I do also want to um, just point out that uh, this, this is sort of rounding out the end of Food Security Policy Month on AgriLink, so check out the rich array of content that um, we've been posting daily there on that topic. Um, and um, do uh, stay tuned in July. We're going to have a focus on the enabling environment for agricultural market systems, so um, sort of a nice runway from, from policy. Um, and that will be in conjunction um, with the EAST project. So, um, so look out um, soon for news on our July webinar, which will be in conjunction with that project. So again, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us today and, and for, for sharing your insights. Thanks for having me. Have a great day, everyone.